Bonjour Klosemann. Et bienvenue à Paris. Et bon anniversaire. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, do you remember uh, 25 years ago when you had in your hand the really first CD entitled with the Naxos uh, name on it? Well, I did not have very high hopes. <laughs> uh, there were five titles which we had released in Hong Kong for the Hong Kong market. And uh, I thought, well, this looks nice, you know, and uh, will be little business. But the day after, the telephone started ringing from all over the world. They wanted to buy these cheap CDs. So then I knew it was better than I had thought. Who were your hopes at that time? Were they very light or very ambitious, or was it? Well, I had really no hopes at all. I thought this is a short-term business to sell a few CDs uh, at the price of an LP. Uh, and I was as surprised as everybody else when it continued growing. So let's go back not to the future, but now. Uh, how to produce a recording in uh, 2012? The biggest problem is how to make money from producing recordings, because most of the things we produce today lose money. Uh, if you, have, you make an orchestral recording, and you know our price is still relatively low, and if the uh, material is in copyright, it is impossible to make money. Uh, we make money from uh, lute recordings, guitar, piano, and that's it. But uh, because we have a huge back catalog that is available online, where every title makes money, we can afford to record things that lose money. Where is the place you recorded the most? Everywhere? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, still at the moment is England, mm. very strong, uh, United States. Uh, we still record a lot in Warsaw with the Warsaw Philharmonic. Uh, we record with the uh, MDR in uh, Germany. We quite a few things in France with Orchestre National de Lyon. But those are our main, and New Zealand, New Zealand Symphony. It's a very good orchestra and we have an exclusive agreement with them. Is it always like uh, to find a good balance between uh, uh, the financial aspect of it and getting a good sound quality in a certain level of well, quality? Well, it's the financial conditions, but also is it, uh, is, it are the, is the orchestra and is a conductor, are the artists suitable for the repertoire? Mm. We always try to have a, like a national component. French music in Lyon or If you cannot get a French orchestra, we want a French conductor or a mm. French soloist. Same thing, English music, English orchestra, or if you cannot find English orchestra, English conductor. So mm. all the things we do, there's always a, a national element. Mm. How do you see the evolution of uh, your business model from uh, 20 25 years ago to till now? Is it like you have to do like little adjustments years after years? Uh, or? They're not little adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> Big ones. <laughs> So we started as a, a, a budget label, yeah. okay? So now we are, uh, our quality is the same as the full price labels. Mm. Sometimes same orchestra, same conductor, same artists. But we have become a service provider mm. to the classical music industry. Without Naxos, the classical, the independence can no longer exist. Mm. We handle their distribution, physical distribution, digital distribution. And even the majors we distribute, Warner Classics, we distribute Sony Classics in some countries. So we are the main service provider for the classical music industry now and used to be a budget label. It's interesting because today you have like a major role in the classical music planet on it. Yes. And uh, 25 years ago, I'm, some people were looking at you like... A I'm a pirate. Who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody calls it's me. It's interesting, uh, I'm sure. Minos Grise de la musique yeah. classique. And say, well, I don't want to. So, there were not a lot of people uh, 25 yeah. years ago who saw that, no? <laughs> well, they didn't seem as an Eminence. <laughs> a character gris, perhaps. What were the, the main challenges uh, online music posed you uh, in the beginning? Well, uh, we were the first in online music with our whole catalog in 1996. We put up Naxos and Marco Polo catalogs up for streaming in 1996 already, mm -hmm. at a time when bandwidth was very expensive, but it was a marketing exercise. People could listen online and go to a shop and buy. That was the idea. You had a lot of hopes at that time, or it was just, okay, let's try it? Let's try it, yes. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a warehouse manager mm -hmm. who was a, a, uh, an internet, uh, he was internet crazy. He comes to me someday and said, Mr. Heyman, 
can I do a website? I said, what is a website? That was 96 <laughs> okay, so, or 95. I said, okay, do a website. And then I read in 90, early 96, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal or in the New York Herald Tribune where it says the internet will be possibly the future of music distribution. So I went to my guy and said, show me the website. Said, oh my God, you know, <laughs> terrible design. The, the data were all wrong. So it's, okay, close it down. Let's start from scratch. And that's when we started in earnest. Uh, so that was 96. And then in 2002, the cost of the bandwidth started to come down. And then we started Naxos Music Library. And from there it was just a very steep. Uh, we invested more and more money in, uh, in metadata, uh, improving the website. Uh, we launched Naxos Spoken Word Library. Uh, then we launched Naxos Music Library Jazz. Then in 2003, iTunes started. Mm. And we were the first classical label on iTunes because we had all the data and all the digital files. So it was, but from then the, the investment was, well, it was not so steep, but in 2006, uh, we hired an a, a IT specialist as a head of IT and as later uh, chief executive. And from then on, it went like that. We now have 74 people in our IT department, mm. 74. When you're starting uh, doing investments in the digital music, uh, in your mind, was it like uh, digital music versus CDs or it was, or, or was it, or, or were you dealing with, was it like a kind of a schizophrenia between both worlds in the beginning? No, in the beginning the physical sales, until about 2008, 2009, were still the foundation of the business. Mm. And on that foundation we built the digital business. See, we, we did not have to borrow money from other people to build our website, mm. to, to make this big investment. We had always enough profit from the physical sales and I had other businesses. I was a studio business, a sound reinforcement business, all music related business that made a lot of money, which I could invest in that development. Mm. Uh, is it today like you imagine in the first day uh, of di for digital music? No, I mean, I, I think until about 2007, 2008, the digital business did not compensate for the loss of physical business. But from last year already, I think 2011, 2010, the digital business more than compensates for the loss of physical business. That means mm. it's now, we are now much more profitable than we were five years ago, overall. Mm. Uh, how do you see the evolution of uh, the classical music customer? Do you think that he's looking for, him, for himself in a way? Like, it, is this like, a, do I have to buy uh, digital music? Do I still have to buy CDs? How do you see the evolution of this customer? It's a generational thing. The older people above 50, above 45 still want to buy the CD. The younger people, some of them have never bought a CD. They're quite happy downloading or streaming. But the streaming model is also good for older people. They, it's easy, and they have a huge selection. Uh, they just have to pay the monthly subscription fee or the annual subscription fee. Do you think the, the big question is, uh, uh, subscription for streaming versus downloading? I think uh, downloading will not grow much stronger. Than it, it is, is now? It, and it's, now. It's, it's still growing slightly. I think the streaming, and I predicted that in 2002, mm. uh, will eventually be the more important uh, aspect of our music business. There will be many different models, paid, free, half free, half paid, you know, whether Spotify will be there or Deezer in, uh, in five years, nobody knows. We will still be there with our paid subscription service. I think uh, what will happen is there will be more specialized services uh, because people can no longer find things. So uh, for the iTunes has 28 million tracks. How do people find what they're looking for in this enormous mass? So I think there may be specialized services may spring up like Naxos mm. Music Library, there may be one for world music, one for jazz, one for uh, uh, cabaret. Mm. I mean, it may get more and more specialized where people who are interested in a certain type of music can find what they are looking for. Yeah, plus the thing is that you're talking about people who are looking for something. Uh, what about people who are just like classical music, they don't know, they need like recommendations or... Uh, 
So this will be thing what they call curated mm. uh, repertoire. Mm. So we have to give people then uh, a guidance mm. what to listen for. What are the most important symphonies? Who are the most important composers? What are their most important mm. works? Mm. And help them understand what they're listening to. So what about the life of the CD? Because you said that people who are, let's say, about more than 40 years old are still very close to the city. Does that mean that when these people are not going to be alive anymore, the city well, is going to die with them? I, I, look, be careful. I'm 75, <laughs> you know. So 40 to 75, there's still 25 years. Mm. So, but I think uh, CD, at least another five years. Mm. And then maybe after five years, we have to be very careful what we make in CD. Maybe we, today already we have some quite ma many titles we release only digitally. And maybe make, we make 500 CDs for the artist. In five years' time, there will be very few titles we will still make physically. And maybe 75% of what we release will be only digital. And we make only physical CD for the artist to sell at his concerts. What is uh, the percentage of the, of the CD today in your, in your business? Is it uh, still heavy? Well, yes. I mean, in terms of the turnover, it is still probably 75%. But in terms of the profit, it's only 10%. 90% come from digital. From the downloads, for, we get a big check from iTunes every month. Uh, we get a check from eMusic, from Sound Exchange. There are many new sources of, of revenue for digital music. Mm. And, so that, and that always is 100% profit. There's no stock, mm. no shipping costs, no warehousing. And so uh, as I said, 75% is physical turnover, 90% is digital profit. Mm. Personally, how do you listen to music as a meloman, as a music fan? Do you deal between like CDs and uh, downloading? You have like phases? I listen to Mark Naxos Music Library because <laughs> we get every day 30 new recordings on Naxos mm. Music Library. Mm. I only listen to CD when a new artist sends us a CD to listen. Then I listen with my wife and say, sit down, listen, because she decides who will get recorded. Mm. Otherwise, I don't listen to CD anymore. Mm. How do you see uh, different markets? I mean, and especially the American market. Is there some specificity? Well, that's where all the things, these developments happen first. Mm. You know, I mean, except Spotify, which started in Sweden, and Deezer, which mm. started in France. But all the other things, everything's the is, uh, United States is the biggest, most advanced market where we also make the biggest money from, I mean, the biggest download service, that's the most, yeah, yeah. iTunes started there. You know, eMusic is there, uh, Amazon is a US company, yeah. Google is an American company, and yeah. that's where the whole online thing is happening. Deezer and Spotify is the minor yeah. factors. So is it for, is metadata <laughs> like the, the key issue of digital music? I think metadata, very good metadata, uh, a very good search engine mm. and a very good recommendation engine. Mm. If you have those three elements, you will be successful. Mm. Everything else is negligible. So how did you work for you from day one, metadata issue on digital music? Well, you we focused have, we have how many uh, people do you? We have 20 musicologists in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, we have seven, eight database people. Uh, so as I said, we have 75, 74 people in our IT department. Developing apps, mm -hmm. uh, developing iBooks, eBooks, and we have a lot of material. So uh, we are ready for. We have, and we have the, everybody else's data too, mm. like like Cobras also. Mm. They have mm. everybody's data, mm. but our data are better because we created every, every all the data ourselves. Mm. Even EMI, we created our own data mm. from their physical products. That's why our data are much better than their yeah, own. But how do you explain that? That uh, in the beginnings, like a big major company did not invest so much in like metadata. Well, you see like big labels who have like horrible metadata sometimes. Yeah, but this is, they, they just based their data on their normal physical requirements, mm -hmm. what they need for the warehouse mm -hmm. uh, to identify a recording. They didn't look at deep search later, like a category of music, mm -hmm. genre, country where it was composed, the period. So we have all these these components in our metadata, the name of the publisher, the playing time. You know, we, we recalculate every, every time mm -hmm. we add a recording, we recalculate the playing time of a piece. Mm. Because we have, let's say, we have La Mer, 
for 20 recordings. Mm. Average playing time, 20 minutes, tw 25 seconds. A new recording comes that is 20 minutes, 28 seconds. We recalculate the average playing time to 20 minutes, 26 seconds. Yeah, so this kind of thing, people don't didn't think about. You have to be in the business, the business like yeah. you are in business. I mean, Cobras is in business. Mm -hmm. We are in that in that digital world, mm -hmm. and we realize how important it is to have that metadata. Do you believe in like uh, multi languages uh, metadata? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. But we haven't, we didn't think of it when we started, mm -hmm. and that's our database structure. Is not easy for translation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are thinking about converting our database structure to uh, where every every component of a work title has its own column, has, it, has its own field. Mm -hmm. Then we can auto-translate, for example, string quartet. Mm -hmm. That's easy to uh, a quatuor accord. accord mm -hmm. no? So then you can say automatically that, that whole column languages, yeah. is automatically, mm -hmm. and you have uh, the, the key, en la mineur, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and so on. So if once we can convert our data to that new structure, where every, every component has its own field, we can auto-translate 95% of everything. Mm. We're working on that. <laughs> what do you see as uh, the product of the future? Do you have in mind uh, uh, what is uh, like, a, like a growl, like something? Is it a, for you, a product has to be like a musical product and a classical music product. Is it like a, it has to be a CD plus uh, a digital version, or it depends? Or No, do I don't it? think CD will be part of the future mm. ideal package anymore. Vinyl? It would be, ni it would be nice, but mm. let's, let's forget yeah. about that. But I think the future ideal project pr product will be an app mm. uh, that has many different uh, multimedia components. It may be an app with the life and works of Beethoven, you have a text, you have extracts of the music, you have maybe some footage. Uh, and I think this will be, the, the I think, one of the, 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 the uh, products of the future. High resolution has a future. Mm. At least it looks like it right now, mm. uh, because it's supposed to be better than a CD. Uh, whether people can hear it or not is another story. It may be more in the mind than in the ear. Uh, uh, Blu-ray may, may, ha may have a future. Mm. Uh, I understand that Universal is also now considering a Blu-ray audio product, which we pioneered. Uh, so we don't know, but I think a, a big thing will be something can be delivered over the internet and is very rich in content, mm. like an app. You talked about like uh, generation uh, differences. <coughs> Do you see differences between like countries or uh, continents, or not that much? No, there's big difference, I and mean, we have. I think the most advanced in online delivery of music is probably uh, Korea, Japan, mm. and the United States. Mm. Uh, Germany is still very far behind. I think France is still mm. behind mm. In the, behind the curve. Scandinavia, despite Spotify, download business is very bad. Mm. They never went Finland. Uh, Scandinavia is not very good for digital mm. business, except Spotify destroyed a lot of the physical business. Mm. So it's, it's Korea, Japan, United States, and the rest of the world is still far behind. What about China? You're oh, sorry, China is also there, but it's 99% pirated. Hmm. How do you so see the evolution in the future of China for you who, who know this area for a long time now? Well, the music library is doing very well in China. Uh, I just I took a look at the turnover. The legitimate total music industry in China last year was 65 million US dollars only. Mm, Not yeah. good, and that's one percent of the total business. Out of that, one percent was Naxos Music Library, because that's all legitimate business. Mm. So, the, but the Chinese government, I think, in due course, will will pr pr start protecting copyrights, mm. because their own companies now develop uh, patents, they develop uh, a copyrightable material, mm. and once there's uh, enough substance there, I think they will probably enforce copyright. Mm. Uh, on the artistic side of. Uh of the business, of the business. Uh, what do you look for today, and uh, what is your ANR uh, policy? Well, the strangely, even though the catalog is already huge, there's still gaps in the mm. catalog. So the f number one consideration is always we have to fill a gap in the catalog. Yeah, not duplicate something. Yeah. What is still missing? Mm. So we don't have all the Mozart masses. So that's another mm. project. Mm. We don't have all the Haydn piano trios. So we're doing mm. those. Uh, there's still opera ho holds in our opera catalog. Then we have 
our composer, our conductors and our composers too, and yeah. orchestras come with ideas. I would like to do this. Uh, like Joanne Falletta just took over the Ulster Orchestra. Yeah. So she wants to do English music now. Yeah. Uh, in Buffalo, she will do the Glare Ilya Muramets complete for the first time. Yeah. Uh, then we have to keep our artists happy. So we have to, <laughs> they have to, they want to make at least one or two records a year. Yeah. So we talk to them and say, look, what would you like to do? What is still missing in the catalog? Or what is old and not so good? We could we do that again. So it's a combination of factors. And we, we, we're looking for exciting new artists that have more than just fingers mm. that can say something mm. about the music they can express and, and my wife decides who is good <laughs> do you think that people will sing the music in terms of uh, albums again or not anymore because of downloading and all that uh, we know that we can <coughs> do more than 74 five minutes i don't know exactly the, well uh, we no i think that it's a good thing but at the moment that is it's a very good question at the moment The concept is still an album concept, hmm. limited up to let's 79, yeah, 79 minutes. minutes. Yeah, uh, but we now uh, be, we now have sometimes a digital version, for example, uh, where we add a movement, <laughs> or we add another version that now goes above 80 minutes. Yeah. And for example, in uh, on Blu-ray, there's no more playing time limit, so we do Schumann scenes of Goethe Faust. We do that on one on one Blu-ray. That's on two CDs, but on one Blu-ray. Yeah. And of course, online is one big file. Yeah. So uh, as long as physical CD is still the main product, we will still look at the album concept. But let's say in three years time, we may, longer, may no longer look at, look at it that way. Mm. We may then look at a digital album and maybe have a cut version for the, for the physical. Right now, we'll make a physical album and maybe add a little bit of music for the digital, but maybe in three years, we will do the other way around. Mm. So you tell us about uh, the product of the future, but how the industry will look like in like 10 years? I mean, regarding like actors of the labels, majors and all that. Uh, do you think that, uh, because we know that there was a huge evolution only regarding, for example, majors. It was, so now there's only a bunch of people. And what's going to be in the future? And what's a label going to mean in 10 years? Well, uh, the, I mean, the A&R still has to be there. Somebody has mm. to decide what to yeah, produce. This is good, this is bad, we have to record good, it. And they that. have to produce it, so mm. that, that will still be there. But I think most labels will not have warehouses anymore, physical mm. warehouses. Mm. Or they may, may use one warehouse, like in our case, we have this logistics center in Munich, which now delivers to the French retailer. Also start delivering to the Spanish retailer mm. and already delivered to the German retailer. So labels may not need warehouses anymore. So what do the labels do? They do NR, they produce, and they produce digital marketing elements. They have to create uh, e-cards, uh, digital catalogs, all kinds of digital material, uh, special apps to search for their repertoire. And the national distributors will have to do the same for their markets. Mm -hmm. So I foresee a, a major record will not no longer have warehouses and shipping departments mm -hmm. and salespeople out there selling to shops, but they may have a digital marketing apart department in their main office. Do you, do you think that uh, only digital labels have a future? Well, you, if you cannot do digital business in the future, you have no business. Mm. I mean, you must be, this must be the future. Mm. I mean, I, I love the CD. I would love to, to continue selling CDs, you know. I look at this display outside, mm. there every 6,000 Naxos mm. CDs. It's wonderful, but it's not sustainable, mm. you know. But the, the digital uh, is, is a future. We just don't know quite what it will look mm. like. What kind of uh, listener are you? Do you have like phases? Do you listen mu to music always? Like when you're in a plane, you have like a headphone on your, uh, on your no. head or you have phases? Or does I, don't listen, I don't listen on the plane. On, on the plane, I read. I have time to read, so on a long, especially on a long flight. Mm. No, I do, I'm, uh, I regret to say I'm now a, um, a professional listener. I only listen to things which come up in the, in the, mm. in the way of the new recordings, uh, things I have to discuss with my wife, you know, whether we sign a new artist. I don't really listen, just listen. Uh, there are some things, a new recording, which I, is close to my heart, like scenes from Goethe's Faust, uh, 
the new Jana Czech recording. So mm. I love Jana Czech. So mm. I listen to those for pleasure. Mm. But all the other things, I have 30 new releases a month, mm. you know, and it's all the additions to, to Naxos Music Library. I have to listen professionally. If you look at the, all this Naxos huge uh, album collection from 25 years, do you have like, uh, maybe not 25, but let's tell us like uh, five, six or seven albums that were very close to your heart? Maybe not in terms of sales, maybe in terms of uh, musical uh, value or... I know it's a bit like choosing between your children, but... Uh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, I like my wife's Mozart concertos, violin mm -hmm. concertos, among my favorites. I like my wife's Butterfly Lovers, this Chinese concerto, which has... And I wish I've heard her play more often than any other piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard her play maybe 50 times in my... Which is... Mm -hmm. uh, because she plays a lot in China. Uh, I, lo I love those Janacek orchestral suites, which mm -hmm. I commissioned and paid for, and which cost me a lot of money, but I love <laughs> listening to them. It's a great experience. Uh, I like our Mahler 8 from Warsaw, which I think was, I think was a tremendous achievement. Uh, I sometimes listen to our Haydn string quartets from the Kordai Quartet. So those for me are some of the highlights. Thank you very much, Klaus Simon. Happy birthday again. Thank you, thank you.